Live from the Export Beer Garden Studio, welcome one and all to the BYC, your home for all things cricket. The start of the Plunkett Shield is always a good sign that the cricket season is starting to heat up. Add to that the impending thrust and parry of the 2020 Cricket World Cup, and you know it's time to break out the crocs, crack the tab on the tin, and turn on your tranny. For the cricket tragics out there, this is what we've been waiting for. The clouds of the last few months are clearing away as the sun pours through. It's time to stretch out on the couch, close the curtains and let the grass grow, Dylan Cleaver. And mate, so much to get through. I oh, know, it's going to be a bumper show. We just had to crack into it. G'day Paul, how are you going mate? I'm going superb. Oh, I can't wait. God, I love cricket season. Oh, love it. It's so good, isn't it? But listen, let's start off New Zealand and also Pakistan on Friday in the Antarctic series. Uh, shithouse. Uh, but on the bright side, uh, Dylan Cleaver, steady the ship, showing, uh, showing some form. Yeah, yeah. And I've ha- had a bit of correspondence actually from people s- sort of saying, well, you have know, we reached a stage with Kane now where he scores runs just often enough to keep his place in that T20 team. And I think it's worth reminding people that his T20 record is actually really good. He's had a poor year, and I think he'd be the first to admit that. But if you look at his entire body of work, it's it's pretty bloody good. So, no, I don't think we're at that stage yet. And where we lost this game, or where New Zealand lost that game, sorry, the Royal We, was – Almost the opposite how how we've lost other games and that it was that hitting at the end of the innings that completely failed. Yes. We're in a great position to launch with a two, three overs to go and we just never took off. And that meant we were 10, 15 runs short and, and Pakistan ran it down last over. It's kind of reminiscent in some ways, Paul, and a kind of reflection of the season really for the Black Caps, nearly but not quite. Again, when you were talking about that, like it's like we're saying, oh, we're quite good, nearly, but we just get over the line. And again, we used to be able to get over the line on these games only a couple of years ago. What's changed? Have we passed our peak? I am nervous about that, I must admit. And, you know, that's right, DC, you know, that hitting at the end, we got stuck, we got submerged, um, and those guys did have time and they just didn't get it done. And then we had, you know, I guess the unusual situation of Ish Sodi getting absolutely pumped mm. for 25,000 runs or whatever it was in that over, and that was a match turner. And I feel like there's almost this – maybe there was some complacency kind of built in that we just expected to win um, from from that position and took the foot off the throat. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, because the T20 uh, World Cup is imminent. Very imminent. Uh, well, in fact, it started. The pre-tournament the, tournament the pre, started. The pre-tournament sort of started – Technically, um, weirdly, guys. Oh, I just went all prepubescent then. <laughs> I haven't done that since I was like eleven or twelve years Woo! old, fellas. Uh, weirdly, though, weirdly, and, and I don't know. Well, I sort of do know where it comes from. I'm kind of optimistic about this because we've waxed lyrical about this team, and maybe we are past our best. But the fact, Dylan, that we've kind of retained the essential unit gives me some confidence for this tournament. Weirdly, yeah, I'm. Relatively confident as long as we're chasing most of the time. Yes. I've lost faith in New Zealand's ability to set competitive totals consistently now for some of the reasons we've mentioned at ad nauseum probably over the last two or three podcasts. I don't think we go quick enough, early enough. Uh, take um, Finnell out of that equation, obviously. If he gets going, it's a different story. But I think we get bogged down a bit too early and we rely so massively on – that Nisham punch at the end to get us to somewhere competitive that I, I just think it's a fallible game plan. So yeah. I'm, I'm maybe not as optimistic as you are. Well, he, and it's interesting, you know, because we were talking about India in the last T20 World Cup, Paul Ford, uh, and they were massively guilty of playing really conservatively and they paid the price for that. And uh, I wonder if that's a bit of an Achilles heel for us at the moment, that that we are a little bit conservative and and hoping that the big hitters towards the end of the innings will sort of pull us through. But there's nothing worse, is there, in, in, a, in a quick format like T20, where you sort of meander along, uh, you set yourself a bit of a trap, really, if the boys at the back don't fire. Yeah, that's right. And it's, I don't know, maybe, and maybe in a knockout tournament, it is harder to just go pedal to the middle, foot to the floor, 
you know, game after game after game. And, and I think in some of these tournaments, the scores have not been as high because finally um, every single game is a game that, that matters and there's a ton of pressure on it. And to be fair to, to the New Zealand team, every tournament we've gone into, we haven't really been a favourite. And then over the last, um, you know, three at least, we, we've kind of over overachieved. So we're strangely good in, in knockout tournaments and maybe it just doesn't really matter so much that we you know lost that game and we just lost that series and all that sort of stuff yeah and if you look at the warm-up scores well actually they're not warm-up scores if you look at the pre-tournament tournament scores they are probably well below what we expected on Australian pitches and some of those wickets have actually looked really tricky to bat on and if we get a few of those then my optimism level rises, rises. yeah well that's that's our niche isn't it those sort of fiddly little wickets. It used to be our sort of our, our major strength with the with yep. the Lathams and whatnot when those little horrendous pitches we used to play on. Yes, and we also we back ourselves that our top order bowling is good enough to to knock over the top uh, two or three guys in every eleven in the in the team. We hugely rely on that, and then we rely on Kane um, being the sheet anchor, I guess, and and if, and our innings being built around him. So I think those two things, along with Nisham's hitting, um, and, and maybe maybe the other person that's crucial is what do we get out of Daryl Mitchell? He's out of the first game, I think, so he's back for the F game two. Game. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think put him in the same. K- Kettle as, as, as Nisham, you know, we massively rely on him pumping sixes at the end. Yeah, well, let's just talk about the first game, New Zealand versus Australia, Saturday at 8pm. Crucial, fellas. You you can't help but feel if we can topple the Aussies, and I say that, you know, mm. with butterflies in my stomach because I've still got that mental block against the Aussies. If we get off to a flyer, Dylan, uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, and the SCG where they're playing can be a bit sticky. Yeah. So we've... We relied heavily in that um, Antarctic series on spin bowling, so perhaps Bracewell uh, can play a role there. Obviously, Mitchell Santner will be playing a role. Ish Sodi worries me a little bit. It's it's not even the fact that he got pumped for twenty five off that over, and which was where Pakistan won that final. Just hasn't looked that good. Yeah. You know, can I just say this? And it, and it's all very well to say, you know, it was one game and he got pumped in that over. Mm. Um, and, and it's all very well for me to make this point. But I've always kind of felt that with Ish Sodi. That, that uh, not that he's been lucky at times with the wickets he's got, but he has the potential to be pumped, Paul Ford. <laughs> it's, yeah. I think that when I look at Michael Bracewell's bowling as well. Yeah. Um, but there's obviously some some guile and some wizardry going on behind it because they've played against enough, well, he's played against enough good players and not got pumped very often. That I think, I reckon, I reckon we should give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, and for sure. I agree with Dylan. Like, I think playing at the SCG against Australia is going to be, um, you know, potentially pretty helpful for him. Um, and look, I think Aaron Finch is lying in bed at night worrying about Trent Bolt. I, I really, I said it last week and I think he's still worrying this week. Bolt, and Finch, it's just it has felt like a mismatch the last few times they've come up against each other. So, I, I, yeah. I know, um, what I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying there, Paul, but I, I've got a feeling with old Finchy now that he's going, oh, you know, let's just get out and have a go. It's uh, his last tournament? Yeah, it's his last one. I don't think I don't think he's sort of stressed. He doesn't strike me as the sort of guy that stresses out too much. But listen, let's talk about our Paul. Australia, England, Afghanistan, and from either Group 1, uh, Netherlands or Namibia, or Group 2, uh, Zimbabwe and West Indies. How do we feel about that, Dylan? Yeah, but we're still some way of getting clarity around those last two spots who qualifies. It could be Sri Lanka. It could be Scotland. Um, we, we don't know yet. Uh, Australia, England. Australia haven't been travelling well, but they always travel well against us. Yeah. Um, England are a team that, I th- that I'm worried can blow you out of the water. But again... As Paul rightly mentioned, Southie and Bolt against a team that just goes foot to the floor from ball one, you know, there's every chance England could be 30 for four. You know, yes. Uh, but there's also the worry that they can be 80 for naught after a, <laughs> about six overs. So, yeah. so you've got a chance against them. Uh, look, Afghanistan probably need um, Rashid Khan to do the damage. You'd, you'd favour New Zealand and Australia conditions there. Yeah, I mean, fighting chance, as always. Yeah, it's tight, though, Paul, isn't it? It's tight. 
Yeah, it is. And the, the pitches are going to play a massive role too, aren't they? I mean, we expect... It's weird that we're sitting here talking about, you know, Ish Sodi and uh, so you've got Zamps, who's a, a, a wonderful bowler in T20s. And traditionally, you would have thought that, um, you know, in Australia, it's all about pace bowling, bowling fast, bounce, short pitch deliveries. It feels like the T20 world is hugely reliant on on, on spin and, and whether those guys can suppress the batsmen or get pumped. Yeah. Well, massive game uh, on Sunday, India versus Pakistan at the oh, MCG. Mate, How good. How good. I don't care what format it is. If you don't watch that game, you're a dirt brain. I mean, that, <laughs> that's just going to be huge. I, I was fortunate. One of the great um, fortunes of my life was in the 2015 World Cup. I was um, on assignment in Adelaide, Adelaide Oval for the India-Pakistan uh, 50 over World Cup game one occasion just walking to the ground was one of the great joys of, of my life actually there was certainly no sign of tension there uh, then and not really afterwards either um, India won the game and it was just uh, unconfined joy around yeah. the stadium just yeah buckle in as you say take the top off a tin yeah recline Make sure the kids are nowhere where they can pest you. Yeah, hand down the tracky pants there, pull the curtains, uh, pull forward. Hey, speaking of India, I don't know if you guys were watching uh, India versus Australia. Um, KL Rahul, um, some magnificent hitting. Oh, he's a good player. God, well, that's, I, I know he's a good player, but this was next level stuff. He was pumping them. Magnificent knock. But anyway, uh, you'll be watching that, won't you, Paul? Oh, my God. I, yeah, I can't wait. A sold-out MCG. Actually, the SCG sold out for the Australia-New Zealand game too, so it's going to be great to just watch crickets with these massive foaming crowds, uh, even if there's too many Australians in them for our liking. Yeah. Hey, um, God, what's this about, fellas? Namibia beats Sri Lanka, Dylan Cleaver. Didn't just beat them. Pump them. Pump them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and they were pretty unlucky – I was watching the game last night. They lost to the Netherlands in the last over. Uh, they look pretty good. They've got the guy, um, look, he must be approaching 40 now, Visa. Yes. David Visa. Uh, yeah, look, I, I'm trying to work out in my own mind whether this pre-tournament tournament is the greatest idea in cricket or whether it's the worst and whether, whether in fact, the best idea is these teams. 2020 has kind of um, narrowed the gap. Like, it has, like, yeah, very much so. It, you put these teams in a test match, it'll be a joke. Yes. It'll be over in two and a half days, a waste of time. But with T20 cricket narrowing that gap and um, bringing them into the field, it should just be a bigger tournament. It should be a four pools of five teams each, oh, four teams each. You know, the, they shouldn't be playing this pre-tournament tournament is what I'm getting at. They should just be in the field. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it has definitely, Paul Ford, tightened the contest. Uh, and then Scotland go ahead and bloody give the old West Indies a bit of a going over. Hammered them. Hammered, mate. And that that was a hiding as well. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you, Dylan. It would be, why aren't they playing all the good teams? I mean, it's this victory, if anything, was more extraordinary. I loved hearing the Namibian guy talking after the game, and he was like, we thought we were playing for second in, the, in all of these games. We thought we'd all get smashed by the West Indies. We thought everyone in the other pool would get smashed by Sri Lanka, and, and here we are. We're, 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 we're top of the group, and we're sending the photos of the, the pool around to all of our mates. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and I've got to say, because as you know, fellas, I'm not a big fan of T20, but uh, that – that for me is its redeeming feature: is that it does tighten up these games. That it, you know, anyone on their day can sort of have their way, kind of thing. Now, uh, Dylan, Netherlands scraped by UAE and Namibia. Yeah, so that uh, two from two. Um, Netherlands with three Kiwis. Yes, uh, Tim Pringle, son of Chris. And How good is he, by the way? He's a better cricketer than his dad, Tim Pringle. Dead set, better cricketer. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> Yeah, dead set better cricketer. Uh, Max O'Dowd, who we had the pleasure of having, having on the show. Too, yeah. he, what a right. terrific bloke. And uh, Logan Van Beek. So it's uh, And there might even be a couple more hiding there Paul, that Paul can tell I us think, about. I was going to say, it's Fred, Fred Clarsen's got quite a twangy New Zealand accent. I, I, don't, I don't know. I know he's, pr- he's probably quite a, uh, what do you call him, a cosmopolitan cricketer, but def- definite signs of New Zealandness there, I'd say, too. I, put, I think Rolf van der Meer might have played in New Zealand. A bit. Waiting! 
waiting. Speaking of um, Pringle, how did we miss him? He looks a good bloody bowler to me. You know, and when, so when he, our spinning he was scout, New Zealand under nineteen. He was, yeah, because I'm thinking, you know, with our spin stocks, he. I like him. I like the look. I like the cut of his jib, boys. <laughs> But anyway, well, he was born in the Netherlands yeah. when, when um, the Pringles were over there. Played New Zealand under, so he's there or thereabouts. And I guess we can always rip on him and um, tag and tag and release him when we need him down the track. Uh, Paul, Sri Lanka smashes UAE. Yeah, I need Dylan to talk to me about this one. I did miss this one. I was at the pub. I will be honest, and the cricket was not on, so okay. I didn't see that one. Okay, the, yeah, I Paul was this. at the pub getting steamed, Dylan, because yeah. uh, I miss this one as well. Tell us all about it, mate. Well, it's notable for one thing: uh, the UAE uh, leggy who bowls just he just all he bowls is wrong ends. Mayapan took a wonderful hat trick. Had the first guy who was a little bit set caught out um, on the cover sweeper boundary. Next ball was a ripping wrong end that caught the edge. First ball gone. See you later. The next ball, right hander comes in. Wrong and through the gate, oh. castled him. Just, uh, you know, joy. The guys running, for some reason, whenever they took a wicket, they would sprint off in the, <laughs> in the mid-wicket direction. Yes. And, uh, yeah, it was great to see, but unfortunately their chase for a fairly modest total, and again, it was a tricky wicket, um, their chase came unstuck early, and I think they only mustered about 70-odd runs. So the UAE looked look the weakest of those Tier two associate teams. Yeah, they do. Uh, Zimbabwe destroy Ireland. Finally, uh, pull forward. Yeah, they look they look pretty decent in Zimbabwe. To be, to be fair, um, and and so they should be. Um, you know, they've got probably a, I guess a deeper talent pool than some of those other teams. So um, yeah, look, I, I think they I think they look a pretty good contender to go through. But fellas, fellas, whatever happens in this tournament, anything but this. We must avoid an Australian victory as we must avoid hearing freed from desire. Why did we actually it's play? It's a horrible it? thing to listen to. Yeah, it's a disgrace. Just to remind us. Just to remind us, and let's not forget what they were doing. They were running off to get their sunglasses that they'd packed so that when they won, they could spray the champagne around, sing Freed from Desire, hear their sunglasses. It's, it's cultural it's appropriation too. That song is a club all classic. Bad. It should not be played in dressing rooms. Well, let's just pray we don't hear it again, boys. Mm. Hey, just on the uh, the first round Group A, uh, the Netherlands are on four points, N- N- Namibia on two, Sri Lanka two, United Arab Emirates on none. Uh, Group B, Scotland is on two. Zimbabwe, uh, two. Ireland and West Indies yet to get on the board. Uh, Yeah, uh, Group B tonight, a couple of games that will be pivotal to the outcome of that pool. But, yeah, it's it's good fun. Watch it. Yeah, great stuff. Hey, I tell you what is good fun, and it always excites me weirdly, makes me feel like the season's really arrived. The Plunkett Shield starts uh, has started, fellas. Auckland in trouble against Otago at uh, Kennard's Higher Arena. Otago 261 with uh, Thistle Parks 54, Will Somerville 3 for 51. Auckland 76 for 6. Duffy 3 for 22. Yeah, three wickets late on day one. Uh, Got Will O'Donnell out, first ball of the innings. Will O'Donnell, who incidentally had taken one of the catches of the season in the Otago innings, uh, where he was at first slip. Anticipated the player oh, playing the lap sweep. So good. Ran to his left, clutched it at what would have been a leg slip, leg gully. That was good. Uh, but yeah, Jacob Duffy looked sharp. He got a couple of first ballers and um, yeah, Auckland in all sorts of trouble. Uh, Northern Districts in trouble against your boys, uh, Paul Ford Wellington. Northern Districts 225, Henry Cooper uh, 56, Barat Popley 75, Snowy McPeak. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thistle Park's got a mention earlier, which I assume is you being 
Uh, Jace, your poor knowledge of domestic cricket. Yeah, it is. It is. Is that, is that Thorn, Thorn Parks? I mean, Thorn and Thistle Parks, easy yeah. mistake to make. Both sound like lawn mowing weed control businesses. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that one's okay. Um, Snowy McPeak. Snowy uh, McPeak. Not going yeah, on there. yeah. Uh, four for 83. Wellington, 143 for three. Ratch and Ravindra, 66 not out. Yes, yeah, so look, we should say at this point that these um, games are ongoing, they're in progress as we're recording this. So yes. by the time people are listening to it, it's probably vastly different. But uh, yeah, look, Barrett Popley, he's been around for a while. So a snowy McPeak, actually. So, uh, but the important thing in all of that is that Ratchet and Revenger opening the batting and um, in form early in the season, which he sometimes takes a while to get going. And the, uh, the third game, which is of most interest to me, is uh, Central Districts, and they're in big trouble against the Cantabs and Rainy Nelson. Uh, last, when we came to air, they were about 189 for seven, with Will Young uh, having scored 57 and Matt Henry having taken four for 58. And I've got a couple of points from that game, if you don't mind, if you'll enjoy it. Hit us. I went onto YouTube and watched this game live yesterday, and that's a wonderful um, innovation to get domestic yes. cricket on yep. YouTube. Will Young is in a hostage situation at the moment, and Gavin Larson should be arrested. The guy is still being forced to open. He will now say it's his choice that he wants to open. Well, he wants to play, doesn't he? Yeah, so that is Stockholm Syndrome, if ever I've seen it. The guy is not an opener. I'm seeing him... I'm seeing him wither in front of my eyes. This glorious stroke-making number three or four has been turned into a pallid opener. And 57's good. You know, give him credit. But he just doesn't look like Will Young. And I'm just getting angry about it. Oh, Paul, when I came in here, mate, um, for this podcast, Dylan was throwing glasses against the wall, mate. It was just absolute carnage. I had to get him in a bear hug just to calm him down. He was frothing at the mouth about this, mate. Nothing scarier than a seething Dylan Cleaver. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. It's a, it's a, it's a very fair point. And you know, you both made it. You know, Will Young's doing what he's got to do to, to, to get in the team. And um, yeah, it seems like a pretty poor trade off to lose that that in, um, incredible stroke making ability. Um, and he's just going to be um, curbing all of his natural tendencies. Um, yeah, it's a it's a bit of a worry. I, I'm not sure it's – I'm not as seething as you about it, Dylan, not yet, but I'm sure I will be soon. And the one other point I want to make from that game is Canterbury's caps. Oh, hideous. Yeah. Hideous. Well, just on that, because let's talk about the ugliest cricketing uh, cricket apparel. Yep. Um, you're saying Canterbury's first-class hat? Yeah, this is a definitive top five worst cricketing apparel. Okay. Um Australian canary yellow one day uniform. Pretty hard to argue with that, I would have thought. The yeah. MCC yeah. bacon and egg blazer. Some people love this. It's just an appalling symbol of class oppression. The aero pads and bat combo, Chris Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As modelled by Chris Martin, yeah. Oh, wow. um, and what we I've want. Actually, I've got a pair of aero pads, beige ones that got made specifically. They're. You'd hate those, Dylan. You'd absolutely hate those as well, I'm sure. <laughs> Beige aero pads. Sounds sexy. Hey, but we want the listeners to this podcast to come up with number five. Yeah. In the ugliest cricket apparel scenario. So send that through to our correspondents, why don't you? I mean, there'll be votes for the Lucknow Super Giants IPL uniform. Paul, have you got any top of mind that... Z Zimbabwe 1999, kind of sort of a red, yellow, horrendous mix. You know, Lance Cairns gets behind the loud shirt, Dave, um, for sort of people that are deaf and so on, and that's the, that's the shirt of choice that I wear um, every day. Every loud shirt day, that's my go-to, this horrendous <laughs> Zimbabwe shirt with Guy Whittle's name on the back. And you can't – we really can't go past the beige. Ooh. I mean that whoa, 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 that whoa, whoa. grody tan brown. Hey, I this, mean, this is worst apparel, not greatest apparel. Iconic I mean, come symbol on. of New Zealand cricketing success. What is it? How <laughs> uninspiring and tedious! Brown on brown. <laughs> hey, I've got it, guys. Let's light the cricketing world on fire with beige on beige. 
That's my pick. Sorry, Paul. I know you're a Beige Brigade boy. You're preaching but, uh, to the wrong choir. Hey, but speaking of Paul Ford, it's, uh, sail on. It's, uh, uh, it's time for Paul Ford's News or Roos. Yeah, Bill and Cleaver sort of accidentally won last week, which was I, – I, it was actually really annoying, to be honest, Jason. I don't know if you've listened back to that, but it was really annoying. Yeah. He just sort of did a throwaway – Oh, I thought – I was going to do this and going to do that, but I thought I'd just say this and it was right. And he did Lane that. score for me? To be fair – No. No, he didn't. And he said that he was deliberately trying not to, which right. I thought was <laughs> – I thought – Throwing me under the bus. He just said – well, I think he was trying. He was just putting up that sort of um, – that that front to try and uh, – that veneer of – um, being too cool to try, you know. So uh, yeah. Anyway, point was didn't get the, didn't get the bacon for you. Anyway, num- this week, Australian captain Pat Cummins has said he will not feature in any promotional material for Alinta Energy during the final year of its four-year, forty million dollar sponsorship deal with Cricket Australia. But the governing body insists the Test captain's environmental concerns are not the reason for the partnership being knocked on the head a year early. Cummins is a committed climate action advocate and has appeared before in TV ads for Alinta, but said on Tuesday he wouldn't do it again. Not this year, Cummins said when asked if he would appear in ads this coming (laughs) season. He's previously raised objections to Cricket Australia over the sponsorship deal before the announcement earlier this year that the partnership with Alinta would expire at the end of 2023. Cricket Australia said that the partnership was ended early by the energy company because of a change in brand strategy. Uh, Number two, South Africa's new domestic T20 league the imaginatively named SA20, mooted as a major rival to the Big Bash, could be dead on arrival, according to multiple media reports. No Indian broadcasters have bought or submitted a bid for the overseas TV rights to the competition, which will overlap with the Big Bash League in January. Former South African player Neil McKenzie wrote that the new league, whose clubs are owned by IPL franchises, cannot survive without being broadcast in India, the networks are aware that the SA20 are not merely inconvenienced by the lack of a broadcast partner, but critically hamstrung, he wrote, fatally injured in all probability. He reckons it'll uh, be doomed after the first season if they don't get that squared away. And number three, Daryl Mitchell and Tim Salvey were named Players of the Year in the 75th Jubilee edition of the New Zealand Cricket Almanac. Salvey received the accolade in 2013, 14, 2012, 13 and 2007, 8 but Mitchell's collected the award for the first time. Almanac editors, the ponytail Francis Payne and not that Ian Smith, wrote that Mitchell began the past season with a reputation as someone who could come into the national side and do a good job. However, by no means always guaranteed a spot. They said Workhorse Southie soldiered on and had to carry the attack in the absence of Trent Bolt for four tests. They also named Wellington batter Troy Johnson, teammate Ben Sears and Auckland medium pacer Simon Keane as young players of the yeah. Here we go. Great stuff, mate. Okay. It's my first, and I know this one. It is, they're not named as Young Players of the Year. It is Most Promising Players of the Year um, because I'm an avid reader of the Almanac. But in case that's just a clerical error, you need to come back to me. Clerical error? It is. Okay. So I'll only take a half a point for that. In that case, my um, oh, well, hang on! You can't have multi multi choices. Well, that was an error, and I named it, but I had a funny feeling it was a clerical error rather than an actual ruse. Uh, can Such you, a nerd. Can you um, can you introduce Neil McKenzie again? Former South African player Neil McKenzie. Okay. <sighs> Shit. Um, oh, I'll go for s- story. Number one, and I'll say it was four years of a five-year deal rather than three of a four. I'll go three, and I was going to argue, and I feel like I'm barking up the wrong tree entirely. It wasn't the 75th Jubilee. Yeah, it was. Was it? Damn it. Well, that was was my choice. Number two. Ah, grief. Former South African player Neil McKenzie does not write a blog. It was the world famous South African journalist and broadcaster Neil Manthorpe who's been writing about South African TV rights. Uh, how did I dance around that and not get it? Waiting! Waiting! Jeez. I tell you what, uh, Paul Ford's yes. delighted. But right now it's time for a bit of poetry. 
with On the Boundary with Hoity J. <laughs> Can we get a sting made for that, uh, Adam? Uh, of course, that'll be right after Dylan's. Don't get uh, me started on yeah. Sting. Thanks, mate. I, I also, I, I'd like some background music too when I read my poems, kind of just a, maybe a bit of gentle piano or something like that. But this is something that a guy, a big Nige, uh, sent in, a uh, poem that he wrote about my batting technique, Paul Ford, uh, interestingly enough. And it reads... Wow. <clears throat> oh, here we go. Block, block, block. At the foot of thy wicket, O hoity J. And I would that my tongue would utter my boredom. You won't put the pot on. Oh, nice for the bowler, my boy, that each ball like a barn door you play. Oh, nice for yourself, I suppose, that you stick at the wicket all day. And the clock's slow hands go on, and you still keep up your sticks. But oh... For the lift of a smiting hand And the sound of a swipe for six Block, block, block At the foot of thy wicket Ah, do But one hour of grace or Walter Reed Were worth a week of you <laughs> Ah, that's very good Jesus Lofty I'm looking forward to the block, Lofty. block, block And it's, oh, it's getting close actually It's a couple of weeks time, isn't it? I'm actually not going to open the innings, Dylan. I'm going to get you to uh, open. I'm going to. I'm coming in at eight, apparently, because uh, they want some lusty hitting at the end. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm led to believe I'm opening with you. Race does not come to mind very often. Uh, I'm the sort of race. niche him, if you like. Um, hey, now listen. Um, as partners of Last Man Stands Cricket, the ACC is shutting one lucky Auckland LMS team a month this summer with an export prize pack and ACC merch. Win the chance for the ACC to turn up post-match to the grounds with enough beverages to keep the whole team hydrated. Text LMS to 3236 and follow the link to enter your LMS team now. Thanks to our mates at export. And right now it's time for Cricket Violence Corner with Paul Ford. Paul Ford's Cricket Violence Corner. A 21-year-old man was arrested on October the 13th for the attempted murder of his friend after a drunken brawl on Wednesday. They were discussing cricket and the man arrested is believed to have become incensed by the suggestion that current Indian captain Robert Sharma was a better cricketer than Kohli. The Sharma lover doubled down and mocked the Kohli lover for both stammering and then body shamed him as well. This infuriated the assailant who attacked the victim at first with a bottle and later with a cricket bat to the head and then fled. Police released an amazing statement which said both had consumed liquor. As per the initial investigation, one man was a supporter of the Mumbai Indians in the IPL and the other was a Royal Challengers Bangalore supporter. Virat Kohli is of course in no way liable for these events that have transpired. He is currently in Australia. But there is a hashtag arrest Kohli uh, trolling its way around Twitter for our enjoyment. Are you a Sharma or a Kohli man? Kohli. Yeah. Mm. Sharma. Oh, Sharma, actually. No, Sharma. Yeah, same. Sharma, definitely Sharma. The you hell just... was I saying? Well, I'll say Kohli, but don't bottle me. Hey. <laughs> hey, but now it's time, and we don't have a sting for this yet, but Adam's working on it. Dylan Cleaver's Obscure Cricketers of the 90s. Yeah, Adam's working on it. That's a sentence to haunt me. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so, I know the feeling, mate. <laughs> This is uh, by popular request, actually. Uh, we've moved up country, and I got it wrong. Mike Lane um, upbraided me for putting Wellington ahead of central districts as I moved south to north because of the Nelson and Marlborough factor. But we're in CD anyway, and I've had a couple of requests for this person. And he actually happens to be a former uh, teammate of mine, so I'm more than happy to do it. It is the one and only David Lamison. Now, if you caught up with any of the literature or the um, video around um, Heath Davis when he revealed, you know, he was New Zealand's first uh, openly gay cricketer, uh, there was a, a lot written about his rivalry. Well, there was something written about his rivalry with David Lamison. And uh, David is an obscure cricketer, but he actually shouldn't be. He was such a good player as a kid. Um, he was a, like a force of nature, a red-headed guy, he could bat, he could smash it. He was what I call a technical slogger. Like he liked to bash the ball, but he actually had a really good technique behind it, which was rare for, for kids at that age. He was very well coached in Wanganui. And he was a um, medium pacer with a fast bowler's mentality. 
Like he just steamed in and just thought he should take a wicket every ball and would get uh, more and more angry the more balls that he didn't take wicket. He was I just, know, just the type of player you're talking about there, Dylan. Yeah, he was just actually a, he was a hell of a cricketer and he only played five first class games. And the biggest joke about that is that his highest score in those first five first class games was seven not out. And <laughs> And it's impossible if you look at his cricket info page to actually understand what a good cricketer what he was. But the problem was that he was never in the best condition. Like he was a bigger guy naturally, and he just kept breaking down. I think he was out of the game by ninety six when he would have been twenty five years old when he should have been coming into his his peak years. He was just so broken down by then, and he just played so much cricket cricket as a kid you could not go to an age group tournament anywhere without him turning up like when he was when he was 15 he was playing under 20s under 18s under 16s so he, he was that good so he oh, he also played 22 um, list A games and he had more success there averaged about 20 with the bat took 17 wickets uh, but like I said um, he shouldn't be an obscure cricketer because he was so good but he is David Lamison, Wanganui, and Central Districts. Great stuff, mate. Great stuff. Hey, next up we have our new segment uh, with Leader in Z. Topper Correspondence of the Week, brought to you by Leader in Z's Lasagna Topper. And Ryman Quarter writes, If the issue with mancads is stealing runs, why is batting so far out of your crease acceptable? Perhaps if batters are cheating in this way, we could let bowlers run through the crease and throw the stumps down. A more entertaining dismissal than the traditional non-striker mancad. Also unreal potential for harm and fights. Cricket Violence Corner would need its own podcast. Thoughts, fellas? It would be spectacular. It would be bloody interesting, wouldn't it? As you see the batsman start to shuffle his way down the wicket, the bowler... The bowler just runs through and hurls it at the, at the stumps. Run out. Yeah, great. Yeah. Good point. I'm well, mate. I'm on board with it too. Yeah, I'm totally. I'm on board with it too. And, um, yeah, I, I think there's a huge clarion call for Cricket uh, Violence Corner to have its own podcast too. So get in, get in line, Ryman. Great stuff, team. Hey, well, thanks for listening to the podcast. We'll be back next week. And uh, I encourage everyone, let's get into this T20 World Cup. Hey, how good, boys? Yeah, and the Plunkett Shield. And the Plunkett Shield. Uh, summertime, the cricket is on. It is all good. Hey, what's happening on the bounce, uh, Dylan Cleaver? Well, it's summertime. Oh, yeah. So it's, I, I, Cricket it's, is it's on. Packing in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get, get along to it, though. Uh, either Google the bounce Dylan Cleaver or it's dylancleaver.substack.com. Great stuff, mate. Hey, Paul Ford, if people want to get hold of us, mate, what do they do? Slide into the DMs of the Alternative Commentary Collective or the Beige Brigade on Facebook or the Gram or flick an email to byc at beigebrigade.co.nz. We love hearing from you. And uh, just a reminder to all our listeners out there, the ACC is live on Sky Sport 9 this Saturday evening from 8pm. Make sure you tune in.